Welcome back to Management Decision Tools. In this session, we would like to get a little bit more hands-on uh, by drawing out using graphical solution approach to find the numerical answers, the actual uh, values to the optimal solutions of a given linear programming model. So uh, let's dive in and have a look. And the agenda today is really simple, three points. We're going to learn how to uh, draw, all right, draw out hands on, or actually draw out uh, the a visible re rendition of the LP model based on two variable LP models, right? Only two variables. One variable is too simple. Uh, three or more is just not possible to draw it because we need four or five dimensions. Uh, so just two variable problems. We'll learn how to draw feasible region. Uh, draw the objective function line and then subsequently find the optimal solution. So three steps in this graphical solutioning technique. Next, we're going to find the bounds of objective coefficients. What are the bounds that would uh, limit right, the optimal solution to be still optimal when the coefficients of the objective function change? Right? So uh, if they change, then uh, to what extent can they change so that the optimal solution remains optimal? And then we look at uh, four scenarios of how optimal solution or solutions might um, prevail or might be observed in generalized LP models. All right, let's dive in and first learn how to draw uh, solutions to solve the, a given particular LP model. But before we start, let's understand the motivation because really we can only solve two variables uh, in an LP model when we use graphical solution. Um, if it's one variable problem, it's basically just you know range bounding it and then it, it's not that straightforward, but then we, it's not very uh, illustrative. If it's three variables or more, it gets really complicated and it's very hard to, to uh, draw out anything without trying to project the 4D, 5D solution space into a 2D uh, uh, paper planner form. And, and then we lose all the insights that is so interesting, that is so uh, attractive when we are using a graphical solution. So that counterfeits the... Uh, uh, the uh, reason why we want to use graphical solutions. Uh, in addition, when we perform graphical solution, it is manual. We have to hand draw it. Uh, even using computer graphics, you have to program the graphics to draw. So it's not that fast, right? So we are not trying to be fast here. We are not trying to be efficient here, save time. And we're definitely not able to scale because again, we are limited to only two variable where we can comfortably handle it manually. So with, with, uh, with slower, slowness, with lack of efficiency, with lack of scalability, why are we still looking at learning or even trying to spend time on talking about it? But there are interesting aspects when we use graphical solution. Firstly, it's very visual. Uh, when we draw it and we learn how specific components in the visual space correspond with the LP model, you know, which is just, just the, the algebraic form, right? Uh, totally abstract, totally not visible in that sense. Yeah, not, not easily uh, giving us an image of what is going on. But when we draw it out in graphical solution space, it's very visual. We can see the components as we'll see in a while, right? So we can get better insights into how the solutioning process works when, for example, uh, more advanced software like Excel Solver or Python or R, uh, when you use those packages to solve uh, LP models, we can imagine that it is doing it uh, uh, in the same way as we are doing in a two-variable graphical solution, uh, except a lot faster, a lot uh, more efficient, and a lot more enhanced to give us more accurate solution quickly, right? So, so at least we then understand how it works and be able to handle um, any specific interpretation or unexpected um, 
encounters. Maybe it is the bug of the package or something like that. And secondly, we uh, can understand using graphical rendition of the LP model why there are four scenarios of optimal solutions. We'll talk about that uh, after we are done with learning how to draw it graphically. And finally, because of all these exercises in 2D space, we can easily see uh, the links between graphical components and the abstract model. Uh, we can then have better intuition and that helps a lot because then you don't have to force remember, oh, how to solve this algebraically, do this, do that, without implicitly knowing why you're doing all those things. But when it becomes graphical, it's way easier and perhaps more fun and uh, definitely helps a lot for human understanding. So I hope that adds to uh, convincing you why we are going to spend time on this. Now today, we want to uh, solve this particular LP model. And of course, it's by no means uh, limited to just five constraints uh, or six constraints, uh, including the non-negativity constraints. By no means just limited to that, we can have more, but no matter what, how many more constraints we add, it will have, it will have to be limited to just two decision variables, right? Uh, so graphical solutions only works uh, for two decision variables or works well only for two de decision variables. And for simplicity or sake of imagination, I will just define x1, x2, right? As number of tables to make per week and number of chairs to make per week. So you can imagine this scenario as a, a carpentry shop boss trying to optimize the profits per week. And it makes only two kinds of products, tables and chairs. And he wonders, hmm, given limited amount of wood, man hours, uh, and uh, you know, resource limitations and various demands, I wonder how many tables, X1, and how many chairs, x2, should I make per week so that my profit is the highest? Does that sound reasonable? All right. So uh, highest, lowest is you know what mathematicians will call optimizations. In business layman terms, we say I want the most profit, right? I want the least waste. And that will translate naturally to maximizing or minimizing. So we want to maximize the total profit. If making one table gets the boss five dollars uh, after minusing all expenses, right? Uh, imagining making it means able to sell it. So demand is not an issue. So if I make one table, uh, I get five dollars. And if I make one chair, I get two dollars. Then I hope you are convinced that the objective function, the total profit, will be five x one plus two x two. Then we can create some constraints. Now I'll be uh, honest with you, these constraints are created with some experiments to uh, make it easy to uh, draw, covers all the various cases uh, as much as possible without having uh, duplicated efforts and also kind of makes sense. So uh, you can imagine the constraints to be like, um, uh, boss really doesn't want to uh, spend too much time on making tables, so there's a sort of an upper limit. Don't make more than eight tables per week. Okay, and that's not due to any resource constraints, it's just his psychological requirements or some sort of company policy, right? And uh, boss also thought about uh, the ratio of tables to chairs, and he sort of say, well, we are a table company, so uh, don't make more than six chairs. So so eight and six a bit arbitrary, but uh, uh, let's say they are just subjective human or company policies. Next, we can think about um, the kind of uh, resource consumption. For example, it can be labor hours. It takes three labor hours to make a table. All right, well, don't be surprised because with uh, tools, you know, and automations, or the configuration of the factory for this boss, maybe it's easier to make tables than chairs, right? And remember, the tables are just a bit squarish, rectangular. Uh, it's it's probably easier to do that, uh, or more productive or more scalable to do tables than chairs, which may involve curves and all that and take longer hours. So if one table takes three hours and 
a chair takes four hours and every week uh the the, the boss has up to 36 hours of you know labor work to spare then the total amount of hours that uh that will be required in making x1 tables and x2 chairs will be 3x1 plus 4x2 and it must not exceed 36. and then we can say well boss insists that no matter what you know the total number of chairs and tables must be at least one okay that sounds a little bit contrived but um let's say that is a requirement and in general this one can be higher numbers all right so i i pick one because it's uh yeah it's gonna help uh to uh, make our drawing a little bit easier without losing some generality of the discussion here and finally we always have the non-negativity constraints that uh, boss will not not like to hear anything about let's you know make negative two tables uh, so destroy two tables salvage the hours and then make more chairs no, so impossible to do that so non-negativity constraints so this is basically a very simplistic um, model and uh, still it, it kind of can link to this carpentry scenario about how to optimize the making of number of tables and chairs. Okay, before we start, I'd just like to kind of link us back to maybe high school, secondary school days when we try to learn uh, simultaneous equations, right? So uh, let's recall the days when we try to solve simultaneous equations in two variables. Example, x1 and x2. So now it may be tables and chairs, but it can be any number, right? So suppose the boss says, number of chairs must be six. Six, okay, so I, I must have six chairs because of my van, I can, have, I can squeeze in six and anything less than six, it's inefficient. Anything more than six, I must rent another van, not, not really efficient. So I want exactly six. So we'll write that, right? Yeah, so that's one, one equation, uh, two unknowns. Each table takes three hours, each chair takes four hours, use up exactly 36 hours because boss wants to really be efficient and use up all the hours, right? So that's the requirement. And so what you can write is no longer less than equal to, but exactly equal to. Now you can recall that two equations, two unknowns, we can solve it just nicely. Yeah, but then boss says, Total number of tables and chairs must add up to exactly 10 uh, for some reason. So you, well, obediently write down this equation, x1 plus x2 equals to 10. Each equation translates correctly the requirement from the boss. But because they end up having three equations here and two unknowns, we call this situation uh, uh, over constraint situation, right? So we have three equations and two unknowns. Is there a solution? In other words, when we draw the lines, do they intersect? So <laughs> if we were back in the high school days, we might just hope, right? Please, please, please let the three lines intersect or else we will not have any answers. So we go ahead and plot the lines or else solve the algebra. And uh, phew, luckily, all three lines intersect at exactly one point. Or the algebra way to do it is to say, well, the first and the third equation, I deduce that x1 must be 4, right? So let me check 3 times 4 plus 4 times 6. Oh, that's exactly 36. Luckily, uh, 4 comma 6, that is x1 is 4, x2 is 6. This particular solution solves the three equation set simultaneously. So that's kind of luckily, yeah, that's luckily. And uh, in general, we might not be so fortunate because boss might as well just say, number of chairs and tables, they add up to 12, 15, 18, five, you know, so anything but 10, because we know that only when it adds up to exactly 10, will four comma six satisfy all three equations simultaneously. Right, so this is uh, not very generalizable, although it's it's a kind of interesting 
uh, algebraic exercise or drawing exercise, it's not that fun when we try to solve in real life because uh, you know the requirements won't be so coincidental. 